since me and Maddie have now both introduced ourselves, I'll kind of move on to the word nuyam itself, um, what it sort of traditionally meant to the Haisla before being translated into English. So some of you may have come to learn the term nuyam as it has been sort of roughly translated as the word for law, um, sort of like these laws that must be followed, but it's almost right there where it can immediately get a little confusing, in my opinion, especially as somebody that's newly learning the language and getting to know these teachings because there are actually many fluent speakers who may disagree with that sort of translation for it. And if you look in our dictionary here, the one compi compiled by Emin Bach is called a week's is dozio, which means put it into Haisa. Um, Nuyum is a term that kind of appears again and again under different translations. And some of those translations are narrative or history, story, legend, and tradition. So it's sort of a, a difficult word to directly translate into a single English word. Our indigenous languages tend to be a lot more descriptive or figurative, so it can be tricky to try and encapsulate all of that into a single English term. It just seems like our, our languages aren't that clear cut. Um, I've personally grown to interpret Nuyum to be more like general guidelines that can sort of help guide you throughout your life. Uh, I also really like describing it as just our Heisla worldview, which is how, it, it's, how it's described pretty often in the book Heisla, We Are Our History. Um, I think Nuyum is more so just showed sort of our perspective, our outlook on life. It's our collective history and it's our stories from our past. It's teachings that sort of act to serve as these like gentle reminders to us on what we can do to try and make the most out of this life that we've been given. And it's also like reminding us how we can give gratitude for these steps that we're taking on our journey throughout life. Um, I'm, I'm kind of thinking that at one point in time, each family probably had their own form of Nuyam that was their set of standards, it was their beliefs, it was their family stories. But as we'll get into reading here, once I start, um, you'll see that these teachings and the passing on of this knowledge from generation to generation got interrupted by um, some things that happened to indigenous people throughout history, such as residential school and day school. Um, people eventually learned that they did not want to pass on these teachings to their children anymore out of fear that their children might receive the same you know, ill treatment that they received for having those beliefs and for having those outlooks on life. So what we have in this book here that I've sort of uh, referenced a little bit, it's called Haisla, We Are Our History, as told by our chiefs and elders. It was compiled by Jay Powell, and it was edited by Louise Barbetti. Jay Powell compiled all from different interviews with elders in our community, and he kind of put all of those things into this book. And the new young portion of it is sort of just, I guess, the remnants we have of our collective stories as a nation. And it was released back in 2001, but um, not everyone may agree on the way some things have been phrased or maybe some of the wording. So like that's, that's totally okay. This isn't the sort of end all be all on what it means to be Haisla. It's sort of just some, a collection of our stories and it's a place where we can start to relearn this history, relearn these clan stories, these family stories so that we can reconnect to that part of ourselves and kind of grow and build on it from there. This sort of journey of 
reconnecting to ourselves and waking that part of ourselves up again is um, pretty impactful. And this process of reconnection and reclamation of our stories, of our languages, and just who we are as First Nations people or as Indigenous people, it's been explained to me by an elder as calling our spirits back home. He said it was important that we let them know that it's safe to be ourselves again. It's okay to be proud of who we are. We don't need to hide or feel ashamed of who we are and what we believe in anymore. And I can definitely personally attest that reconnecting to these teachings has greatly benefited my overall well-being in ways that I just couldn't have possibly imagined. Like sitting down and simply just having tea with my gran and asking her questions about our family history, asking her questions about her experience growing up in the village, you know, before, you know, Alcan was even a thought, you know what I mean? She was, the, she's been a, alive almost longer than the city of Kitimat has existed, which is a, a really crazy thought to have. So hearing her story really empowered me and it's given me such, such a renewed sense of self-confidence and just general understanding of myself, of my family, of, you know, people's attitudes, people's outlooks. And I'm really just hoping that sharing our Nuyum today, sharing this piece of our history, will kind of help everyone else in a similar way, hopefully having the same kind of impact. And that's why I just felt like it was important to include these teachings in this year's Gaelic Lap Days. So, I don't know, I'm just hoping everyone enjoys these stories and these teachings as much as I have. Um, our plan sort of for the next few weeks is just to read from the book I mentioned, Heisla, We Are History. Today I'll probably start with just an introduction and a little bit of a summary of all of the phrases and beliefs that kind of go into our medium. And in the next few weeks, I'll dive into a little more detail for each phrase because this book has a lot, a lot of information in it. And I don't want to speed or blow over things too quickly because it's a, it's a lot to take in. And I'm just hoping I can slowly, you know, build upon these teachings in the coming weeks. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if, um, Maddie, would you have anything to add there? I know you've done a little bit of readings, but if not, I can just get on to reading the intro and stuff. No, that's great. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, I'll pull the book in front of me here. So, the introduction portion of this book, it says, the Heisla Nuyum is our traditional rule of behavior and conduct, but it is more than a set of regulations to be followed. It's not like the Ten Commandments. We, we can characterize it like this. Our Nuyum is a Heisla philosophy of life that teaches us who we are, our group history, and our personal identity as a member of a family and a clan. Our Nuyam is the Heisla worldview, outlining our traditional beliefs about our relationship to other living things and to the physical and spiritual worlds. The Nuyam is a part of our tradition, but it is not a cultural leftover from the old ways, like a bow and arrow that is no longer relevant in our lives. Our Nuyam is still our law, and it is a good law, and it will always be our law. Yet yeah, Teresa is just sharing um, sort of like a newsletter I created and effort to try and summarize all this information. It's something we're hoping to get up on our website soon. So I'll go back to reading now. Even though our Nuyam provides guidance for behavior in every situation, it is really quite simple. Our Nuyam tells us how to act in any situation of daily life, yet it can be described in a few words like this. With the power you get by being grounded on the earth, 
and with the help of the Creator, always fulfill your obligations to self and to your family, clan and chiefs, to your land and to other living things in it. The Nuyum specifies the details of these obligations to self, family, clan, chiefs, land, and other living things. It also tells us how to carry out those obligations. And finally, it teaches us how to achieve the personal integrity and strength of character to fulfill these responsibilities. Our Nuyum has always been an oral tradition and has been passed on among the Haisla from generation to generation. We learn it from our chiefs, elders, grandparents, aunts, and uncles. Hardly a conversation happens among the older Haisla people without someone telling us, our Nuyum says. But nowadays, there are Haisla families where the children grow up without learning about the Nuyum. Traditional Haisla storytelling habits and teaching of the Nuyum were interrupted by the residential school experience. Many of those who attended residential school either never learned our Nuyum or were taught to feel that it was primitive, sinful, or wrong. So, instead of every family teaching the Nuyum to their children, the line of cultural transmission of our Nuyum became a thin cord with only a few elders speaking of our law. Indeed, some of the traditional knowledge of our Haisla ancestors may already have been forgotten. For this reason, we are writing it down so that it will be preserved and will never be lost. Here then is our Nuyum. We are aware that non-Haisla people sometimes wonder why the Haisla do things that we do or why we may not be comfortable doing some things that other people do. Interested non-Haisla people, if they wish, can better understand us and learn from the description of our law. This ancient wisdom still works well for us. Our new yum will always be the law for the Haisla people. So now, the Haisla new yum, our law. We call it new yum. It is our history and our law. If you ask one of our elders what the new yum is, we will get a set of very simple statements that outline the general rules of Haisla life. If you inquire further, you will be told the reasons for each of those rules. So that's how we will start. We will give the Nuyum in simple statements. Then we will go through each of these general rules and give examples of how the Haisla follow them and the reasons that we do. Of course, no matter how much explanation we give about the Nuyum, we will not be able to equal the rich detail that the Haisla elders give when they tell us about our law. Remember that the Nuyum is guidance. It has general guidelines to help one decide the best course of action, guidelines as to the way things have been done for generations. Those who know the Nuyum well say that there is no order of importance in the rules for our Nuyum. Each thing is as important as the next. Here is a general list of the guidelines that reflect the most basic principles of our Heisla Nuyum. The first being, draw gratefully on the sources of our strength. Ground yourself in the power of the earth and pray to the creator for strength, help, and wisdom. Cleanse yourself mentally and physically. Give expression to your deep feelings of awe for the natural world and its bounty by saying, Noloch, Noloch, Noloch. The second guideline, is to respect and obey our chiefs and support our leaders. Demand honesty, courage, and commitment to the people's good from your leaders. Support leaders who listen to everyone's point of view. And without surrender, encourage negotiation rather than hostilities. Attend feasts politely following protocol. The third guideline is know your history including the background of your tribe, clan, and family. It is the source of your identity and self-confidence. Listen to the elders when they tell our story. The fourth guideline is know our land and our natural world. It is our obligation to be stewards of the land and the living things on it. Never take or kill more than you need. Something has to be left for the future. 
live to the rhythm of our annual cycle, know the weather and the habits of other living things. The fifth is family is first. The family provides support to those who need it, the young, needy, and enfeebled. Pregnant women get special care and guidance. Children of your siblings are your children. Everyone in the family is responsible for teaching and guiding the young. So those are the five guidelines, but it goes further to say that the Nuyum also says this to help in our personal behavior, balance and relationships. The first for personal behavior is to share what you have with others who need it. A Heisla is never greedy. If someone needs what you have, give it to them. The second is be handsome. A handsome person recognizes what is needed, whether an aspect of social fabric or physical environment, and can influence others to help fix it. A handsome person is caring and sympathetic for those who grieve or are needy. A handsome person accepts others as they are and respects everyone. The third is be responsible for your word. If you agree to do something, prepare yourself and make sure it gets done. Don't shrink your obligations or procrastinate. Do what is necessary now. The fourth here is leave your own footprints. You can never fill someone else's footprints. Accept yourself as you are, but also don't be proud or boastful. Good will be recognized without blowing your own horn. The fifth here is, if your enemy spits in your face, don't retaliate. Find a way to avoid stooping to violence because of envy or greed. Be handsomer than your tormentor. The sixth here is what you learn or receive, you give back in some form. A parent should train the children about the new young to take responsibility and not to be lazy, to pick up after themselves and to do things right from the start. Never give children anything they don't earn. And the last here is to let go of grief and sadness. Fulfill your obligations to have a settlement for the deceased and burn food for the dead. And the last sort of general guideline at, right at the end here is to never mistreat animals. A similar mistreatment comes back at you double and to be especially respectful of frogs. So the Heislas believe that our new yum came into being and survived because in each generation there is one, a person who can see things like the future. Second, a person born that can remember having heard something once. And third, a historian that absorbs the history and remembers. We can also think of this in terms of skills. Arnuyam says that in each generation, there will be someone who was born with the skill to be a storyteller, a healer, a wise counselor or judge, a carver, and a rememberer. So if you want to get started on our new yum, as it is as cultural knowledge, because our new yum was not written, every Heisla was taught it. We can say that the new yum was a body of cultural knowledge that was known by every Heisla. In general, the Heisla young people learned it by hearing it over and over. Louisa Smith remembers learning the stories of the Heisla Nuyum from her grandmother like this. With every storytelling that my grandmother gave us in the evenings after our work was done, there was always the story of the Gupskolach Torumpo. We know how important this cultural knowledge is. Native students that know the stories and history of their group are not only more confident and balanced, but they are much better able to cope with prejudice when they encounter it. What follows is a general discussion of the cultural knowledge that is necessary if one is to truly know and understand our Nuyum 
as every Hasla used to know. The presentation follows the statements of the Nuyum as given above. Each section gives only a few examples. Even though our Nuyum, of course, includes all the knowledge that the old people had in each aspect of our law. In the end, our elders understood the Nuyum as a manual for living based on the Encyclopedia of Cultural Knowledge. Probably nowadays, not many know of all the Heisla cultural background knowledge, and it is clearly impossible for us to give it all here but we're going to try and give an overview of the background that the Heisla elders brought to their understanding of the Nuyum. In fact, the elders didn't really try to explain the rules as we do below. They simply taught the Nuyums by stating the appropriate behaviors, as by saying, our Nuyum says. And they told old stories and histories. They told them over and over again. And then below is a more in-depth overview of each of those guidelines I just said, um, which we may be able to get into today, but I think I will take a little bit of a break from speaking. We'll take a break from the new yum right now. And I know that um, Maddie has a story that she also wanted to share today. So, I think I will hand it over to Maddie now, if she is ready. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I chose to share how the Beaver Clan originated among the Kitimat people, as told by Andrew Green to Ronald Olson in 1935, um, because I'm the Beaver Clan. <laughs> okay, so... <clears throat> A long time ago, back during the time of beginnings, there was a man who went hunting. He took his wife along. He was one on the north shore of Kildala Arm, or he was on the north shore of Kildala Arm, camped near the highlands that we call, <clears throat> you're going to have to excuse my mispronunciation of a couple of these words. Um, I'm still learning a lot too. <laughs> um, we call Kumah Nu, um, that we call Kumah Nu there. He was a goat hunter and used to climb up early in the morning and hunt all day. <clears throat> goat hunters have to pay attention to what is Aikilasu. <laughs> now we say taboo or forbidden. In those days, there were lots of things that were Aikilasu. Hunters and fishermen had to know the many things that were Aikilasu because it would result in being skunked if a taboo was broken. For instance, Ulican fishermen are not supposed to get their wood for boiling fires in advance. If a hunter shoots a sea mammal on the rocks, it will storm soon to wash the blood away. That sort of thing. Hunters and fishermen had to know those things that are Aikilasu. One of the most taboo things for a hunter is to sleep with his wife, either just before going hunting or during the hunt. So this story is a man, is about a man who did not break the taboos and what happened. <clears throat> well, the goat hunter came down to the mountain and back to the camp on the first night. He was tired and went to bed early and his wife started to get into bed with him, but he would not let her. She argued with him to no avail. She grew angry and shouted at him to no avail. She pleaded with him to no avail. It was Aikilasu for a hunter to sleep with his wife. Finally, she wrapped in her sleeping furs and slept by herself. The next day, the hunter had good luck and returned to camp with a goat. His wife was not in camp, nor was any dinner prepared. So the hunter built up the fire and put some goat meat on to cook. When his wife arrived, she had wet hair and would not eat anything at all. The same thing happened the next evening and the next. Each night, the wife would show up with wet hair and would not take any food. Her husband couldn't figure it out, but he was always very tired at night and usually fell asleep right after eating dinner by himself. <clears throat> he was a good hunter, and the drying rack was always full of goat meat drying. 
Soon they would have enough dried goat meat put away, and he would stop hunting. And night after night, his wife was refusing to eat and giving the appearance of having bathed when he saw her upon arriving back in camp from hunting. What was going on? <clears throat> what was going on was that the wife was doing the Nakulagula rigorously. Nakulagula is what we Heisla do to become strong and tough and lucky by fasting and bathing in really cold water. <clears throat> Hunters and trappers and fishermen and gamblers and women who harvest and weave and anyone who competes will do better if his Nakula soul has become powerful through the Nakulagula. Someone who pays attention to his Nakulagula can say, I don't look for good luck. Luck looks for me. Well, that's what his wife was doing all day, doing the Nakulagula. Well, this is what the wife had been doing. She was disgusted with the husband for following the Akilasu so devotedly in order to have good luck. So she had decided to do the Nakulagula diligently and become more powerful than her husband. Well, once in a while, the old people say, someone who does the Nakulagula with total commitment will be taken over by one of the spirits of the natural world. And that's what happened to the wife. One day, after the last day of his hunt, the man pretended to go out hunting and then snuck back to the camp. <clears throat> he watched his wife turn her leather apron around so that it hung down in back like a beaver's tail, and he watched her immediately enter the creek and start to work. She had already made a beaver house of green branches and was making a dam. She worked industriously, chewing off branches and building up the dam to back up the water. He watched her work all day. <clears throat> that night, he joined her in sleeping furs, and she became pregnant and gave birth to four young beavers. The husband and wife d divided the beavers into two pairs, each with a male and female, and they put them around our Heisla traditional territory. Every year, the woman who gave birth to four beavers, which they scattered around our land in mating pairs. That's the reason that our traditional territory is rich in beavers. And in between litters of beavers, the couple had human children, who are the ancestors of today's beaver clan, Heisel. So that's the story of the origin of the beaver clan among us. And that's the reason that there are a lot of beavers in our territory. Well. <laughs> awesome. So I guess since you mentioned Nakulagula and that story, I'm, I'll expand on the first guideline where we mentioned cleansing yourself mentally and physically, because then I can talk about Nakulagula. And then I think I will maybe finish off today with sharing the, um, the origin of the Kilowatt clan, as told by Sam Robinson, Gordon Robertson, and others. But first, I will go over more details about this first guideline, which was Draw gratefully on the sources of our strength. Ground yourself in the power of the earth and pray to creator for help and wisdom. Cleanse yourself mentally and physically. Give expression to your deep feelings of awe for the natural world and its bounty by saying, Noluch, Noluch, Noluch. So, the highest the worldview is our traditional beliefs about the physical and spiritual aspects of the world and the place of humans and the other living things in that world. Traditional Heisla people believed that the physical world is not simply inert soil, rocks, and water. We feel that the earth contains energy with strength, with which strengthens the people. We also feel that the animals and other living things have souls and feelings, just as humans do. Our Nuyam says that each person has a soul. We call it our Haley Gah, and that, that we are born with which largely causes our particular personality and which lives on when we die. Traditional Heisel people also acknowledge the creator. We recognize the creator as a personal being that takes an interest in individuals and responds to grateful requests for help and strength. Our Nuyam tells us that we are part of both the spiritual and natural world, and it requires personal ritual activities on our part. So, for 
pray to creator for wisdom and courage to complete tasks. To expound on that, the Heisla have always recognized the creator who made everything, all the things in the world that challenge and delight us and allow us to subsist. The elders say in Heisla, what the creator has created when they see something too beautiful for words, a sunset or a vista, the beauty of unspoiled wilderness, a flock of deer or a school of whales. And we believe that the creator is still with us to help and enable us in everything we do. People communicate with the creator in different ways. Some of us simply think of creator in times of peace in mind, times of peace of mind, and others actually speak to the creator in their thoughts, grateful for the good in their lives, asking for help and wisdom. Heisla people believe that we get our strength from the power of the earth. To expand on that part of it, the elders taught us that our strength as humans comes from the earth. We are just creatures like any other living thing, and we are depleted by obligation, responsibility, and work, especially work with other people. We speak of being grounded with reference to opening ourselves up to the strength of the earth. Our Nuyum tells that we should get up in the morning with the intentions of stopping at some point during the day and looking out at the world to recharge yourself. That's how we do it. Sometimes we also call it centering. This power of the earth is our connection to the land and it's not only true for humans. When men go hunting, if they kill a female animal that is pregnant, there is always a procedure to bury the fetus, to put it back in the earth. The strength from the earth that we are speaking of is actually the power of our mind. It relates to the mental aspect of our cleansing ritual called Nakolagila. Nakolagila, cleanse yourself inside and out, mentally and physically. Traditional Haisla people cleanse themselves and train the young people to cleanse themselves. It's called Nakolagila. The native people of the plains use sweat bathing for cleansing. We Haisla people do it with cold water, immersing ourselves even in the coldest weather. Both men and women do it, but it's not something that's done much anymore. Sometimes cleansing is referred to as a ritual for good luck, and sometimes it did make men better hunters so that your human smell wouldn't be carried to your prey. But cleansing is a ritual to make us strong mentally and physically. We also use herbs in these rituals for both external and internal as a tonic or purgative for cleansing. Much of the effect of this cleansing is mental. The strength of our medicine involves the power of the mind. The mind is the backbone of our medicine. Our elders, both men and women, wore braids. The three interwoven strands of the braid were seen as an analogy for our body, soul, and mind. And when they are interwoven, they are strong and impossible to break. Express our deep feelings for the world and its bounty by saying, Noloch, Noloch, Noloch. When we observe something in the natural world that is remarkably beautiful or something rare that we have never seen before, our Nuyim tells us to express our admiration by saying, Noloch, Noloch, Noloch. When some living thing is killed for our use, when we shoot a deer or eat ulikins freshly caught, we express our grateful recognition that those living things sacrifice themselves so that we can subsist. And again, we say, Noloch, Noloch, Noloch. When the Dachwin arrive, the Ulikin, after not coming for years, we say, Noloch, Noloch, Noloch. We say, Noloch for the rock that holds the ancient painting. And then we say it for the painting itself. The person in each generation who has the gift to see is called Noloch. He or she sees things that others don't see. The Nuyim says that you say it three times, once for yourself, once for the event, and once for the creator. Recognizing the awesome rarities of life by saying Noloch, 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 as our laws demand, is a very Heisla thing to do. <laughs> So that's a bit about that first guideline 
and maybe I will sort of save the rest of them for the next few weeks so that we can still continue to talk about the new yum. And now I will turn to the origin story of the killer whale. So this is the story of, again, like Maddie said, I'm still practicing and learning Kaizo myself. So forgive me if I pronounce any of these incorrectly. This is the story of Nech Nusum Gyat, as told by Sam Robinson, Gordon Robertson, and others. So a long time ago, at the time of beginnings, there was a settlement up near Alaska by where Metlakatla would be built much later. There were only a few families in that village living in old time big houses facing the beach. There were only a few families in that village living in old, oh, sorry. There were, in one of those houses lived a man called Nechnusum Get with his family and relatives. Nechnusum Get and his wife were handsome people by which we mean they were industrious and helpful and polite and good parents. This is the story of how the Kilauea clan started. Like all of our clans, we trace them back to a woman. The Kilauea clan members everywhere are descendant from, his, from the wife of Nechnusum Get. Here's how it happened. Nechnusum Get lived quietly in that village, but on a day like other days, something happened in that village. The people saw a white seal swimming in front of the village. The men grabbed their bows, but the wife of Nechnusum Gyat ran down and told them, try to shoot it in the tail so that you won't hold the pelt and ruin it. In the end, Nechnusum Gyat killed the seal and went out to get it. His wife skinned it carefully, scraping the hide. When she held it up for everyone to admire, she noticed that there were still a few spots of blood on the fur, so she waded out to wash it off. But as soon as the seal skin touched the water, it was as if it came to life again. It started swimming powerfully out, and the wife of Nechnusum Get had to hold on to it so that it didn't get away. She shouted for help, but before anyone could wade out, she was in deep water. An immense killer whale was attracted by the smell of that blood on the seal skin saw the woman and swam between her legs and carried her away. It happened so quickly. She was there one minute and with a sudden splash and a glint of light on a tall black dorsal fin, she was gone. A few seconds later, she was visible again for a moment, astride the killer whale, but as it breached briefly far out in the bay, it headed quickly for deep water. Nechnusum Get took a crew and they paddled all over the bay for hours. Close to the shore, they found the seal skin, but even though they paddled far out to sea, back and forth, there was no sign of his wife. The next day, he paddled even further out, searching to the north and to the south of the village. His neighbors gave up hope of finding her and tried to console him. But he continued to look for his wife day after day. Finally, he went to ask a famous, oh geez, Dudeksiwev, a seer who can find things that are lost, see the past and tell the future. He was told, your wife has been taken by the killer whale and is now his wife. She is far, far away and killer whale will not give her up easily. He decided to go find his wife and take her back. His advisor with second sight looked him in the eye and said, it will not be easy. It is far. You must travel as I tell you until you come to the sea. Look there and you will find a canoe. Paddle with the setting sun on your right until you find two kelp beds near the shore. Beneath these kelp beds will be the start of the road that will lead you to the house of the killer whale. And remember that you will only succeed if you remember our new yum, which tells us to help others. Nechnusum Gyat made preparations. He decided that he would need two helpers if he were going to find his wife. He considered Eagle, who had good eyes, and Owl, who could see in the dark, and Hummingbird, who could fly standing still. But in the end, he chose Pepala, the swallow, who could glide effortlessly all day long. 
His job would be to fly overhead and patrol, across, and patrol ahead, serving as both guide and watchman. But Bala agreed to accompany him on his quest. He also considered Grizzly Bear, who could stand up to the strongest man, and Wolf, who was fast, and Fox, who was sly. But at last, he chose Can Come, the Martin, because he could smell things at a distance and see in the dark. And then Nechnusam Get pecked his knife with an axe, and the three of them set out. They did as the seer had said. It was really far, but Can Come was able to keep them on the right trail, day and night. Finally, they came to the seashore, and Pipala scouted from the air and easily found the canoe. They launched the canoe and paddled. Pipala went on ahead and spotted the kelp beds and then returned, dipping and pointing the direction that they should steer. Nechnusam Get anchored out between the kelp beds, but here only he could continue. He had to go underwater to find the road to Kilowale's house. He sent Pipala home to report to the other villagers, and Kenkum was to stay and take care of the canoe. Nechnusam Get entered the water and easily found the road. As he went along the road, two things happened. First, he came upon a flock of blind geese rooting with their beaks, trying to pull out lake sam roots. They were jolting each other because they couldn't see. When he got near them, he stopped. they stopped and faced him, saying, Oh, there's Nechnusam Get. We can smell him. It was they who gave him, him his name, which is a Simshian name. The second thing that happened was that a group of slaves came along, looking for dry firewood. After some time, they found a tree, felled it, waking up one of their group, who had crawled inside and gone to sleep and they started to cut it up. Unfortunately, while chopping the wood into pieces, they broke their ax. Work stopped while they worried about how angry their owner would be over the broken tool. Nechnusam Gyat offered to help them, saying, I'm trying to find my wife, who was taken by killer whale, but I will try to help you fix your ax. So he rubbed his own unbroken ax on the two pieces of the broken ax and placed them together then rubbed them again with his axe, and their axe became whole again, good as new. Because he had helped him, the slaves told him where to find the home of the killer whale, and they said that they would go with him. The killer whale camp was close. There was a woman beside the fire. He couldn't see her well, but she had been gone for a long time, so he really wasn't sure if that was, in fact, his wife. So, to allow Nechnusam Gyat to see her clearly, the slaves put a load on, of wood on the fire. As soon as he saw her clearly, he knew it was his wife that he had been searching for. Then the slaves helped him by accidentally knocking over the kettle, which put out the fire. Taking advantage of the sudden darkness, Nechnusum Gyat rushed in and grabbed his wife, who recognized him and didn't resist. Kilowale tried to stop them, but he was awkward and had no arms to fight with. Well, Nechnusam Gyat took his wife by the hand, and the two of them ran down the road to the canoe that would take them home. And that's how Nechnusam Gyat recovered his wife, who had been carried off by Kilowale. It turned out that his wife was pregnant and gave birth to the first of the Kilowale clan, and their descendants spread out all over the coast. And that's the story of Nechnusam Gyat long ago and how his wife became the ancestor of all the killer whale clan. Wah. <laughs> well, oh. oh, so Ab has said in the chat that in his studies, he has found that the word Nakolagila is actually a Hanaxila word, and that Lawasila is the Heisel word for our purifying ritual. Uh, would you have the pronunciation for that? Yeah, I'll just, uh, okay, there we go. So, um, 
Nakwa Lagila is the Hanak's yellow word. Dlawa Sila is the highest level. Oh, okay. Dlawa Sila. Dlawa Sila. Awesome. Thank you. I didn't know that. Yeah. Cool. I just discovered that recently myself, just because I was curious about it. And I was researching the, Nak uh, the spelling of Nakwa Lagila, and it led me to that because. The dictionary is looking at it um, right at the end of the definition of Nakwalagila. It has a has these two letters G L that stands for Giplop. So I know that's the oh. kind of word. Oh, and then okay. it said C Tlavasila, uh, which is and it had a little G M, which means get him out, which is the highs the okay. word. Cool. So Tlavasila. Awesome. awesome. So that was sort of what we had planned to talk about today, to cover today, but it's awesome to see the amount of people that have joined us. I'm wondering, does anybody have any questions? Cool, thanks Miranda for sharing that with us. She said now she knows where the Eagle, Beaver, and Kilowatt clan originated from. We've slowly been sharing the origin stories for all the clans. So maybe, I guess, it seems like all that's left to cover is the Raven. So maybe that's what we can talk about next time. Um, does anybody have any questions or does anybody have any specific requests for stories they'd like us to share? You can share them in the chat or if you're comfortable turning your mic on, you can. Hello. Megan? Yeah. Uh, would there be pictures in the, in the chat or elsewhere that we can look at the stories from? Um, I know. Or not yet. Um, maybe not quite yet, but that can be something we work on over the summer, maybe getting these stories um, into some sort of like a PDF maybe that we can share with people or yeah, getting them shared on our Facebook groups or something. Yeah, I can write that down. Thanks. For that. Awesome. Thanks. Cool. Uh, we do have uh, just the stories like the, the whole Heisel We Are History is one huge document. And at the very back of the document is where you'll find um, the, more about the Nuyum, uh, our worldview, and then all of the traditional stories. We do have that portion that's kind of segmented in, uh, in a different file that we could send. Mm -hmm. uh, you can just uh, shoot your email here on the chat, and I can write it down and I can email uh, people who are interested in having the stories to read from at home. That's an option. Way to go, Megan and Maddie. You did awesome. <laughs> Thank you. We just had a really good um, recommendation, actually, with July 1st coming up. That was when we got our Gupskolich poll repatriated to us. So we can definitely work on doing a sort of reflection on that time and maybe like an update on what has happened since. Um, that can definitely be, maybe even we can share the story of Gupskolach. I know Dustin and Coral have that story. So yeah, that can definitely be something we work on sharing. So write that down. Okay. Also our current office location is in Kitimat town but we have an offer of support and help from uh, health admin, uh, Crystal Ross, who's uh, said she can make photocopies at the health center of any docs, documents we might need printing, uh, need to be printed within the village. <clears throat> also just, um, you can also find on the National Film Board website and or app, the documentary of the totem pole, both the um, the whole journey of the return, and then when it was brought back, um, that can be found on National Film Board NFB website and app. Okay. 
Just making sure I get down everyone's emails so we can get those sent to you. Oops. And um, does anybody else have? Okay. Exqualas. Um, does anybody else have any other questions or any other stories they'd like to be shared? Uh, next meeting is same time next Tuesday. Yeah, we'll be continuing. Oh, so we have a story about the North Wind. Yeah, we can definitely look into that. Yeah, next Tuesday at the same time three to four, three to four thirty. Um, I'll be continuing on the other guidelines in the new yum. And then we can definitely look into some of these requests for stories. And we will make sure to cover the origin of the Raven clan. Yes. So I just wanted to add a little bit of what I've learned over time about Nekulagula, because I have a lot of questions about it. Um, I was encouraged to participate in Nekulagula quite a few times by various community members, and I was really apprehensive because when I'd asked my grandmother about the teachings around Nekulagula, um, my first question was, did women do it? And she said, well, she said it's a, it was a very private, occasion. She said it was, it wasn't something that you would, you know, share with people because of the, the process, like you're cleansing your energy and you're cleansing yourself. So she said it was a very private kind of um, event for a person. And when I had asked her if women had done it, she said, or if we had a, a cleansing ritual, she had said, at that time, she said, oh, women have their own, their own way of doing, doing that. And she didn't want to get into details about it with me in that moment because there was a lot of other people present. So I still have yet to ask her more details about that. But she also said too, that as women, our bodies naturally cleanse ourselves. So there's not really a need to uh, participate in those kind of rituals because women were born with the capability of cleansing ourselves. Um, so that was a little bit of a teaching that she had shared with me. Um, and, you know, I had no idea, like, you know, it was said it was like a ritual for hunting and fishing. Um, and an interesting thing about that was that I had no idea that my dad had, had done Nakulagula, like pretty well his whole hunting life and fishing life, <laughs> but that's how that's how secretive or not secretive that's how private the affair was is that I didn't know that my dad was doing that before every hunting trip <laughs> until my mom told me she was like yeah I'm, your dad is, your dad's done that his whole hunting career <laughs> and whole hunting life so um just a little bit of insight about you know the how it was a very personal kind of um occasion but of course as things uh do evolve and change you know people's approaches to it have changed over time. Um, so it's nice to see that some people are um, getting back in, in touch with this teaching. Yeah, it's cool to see people sort of adapting it in their own way as well, if they can't necessarily get down to the ocean or get down to the river, just filling up a bath of cold water and throwing some devil's club in there and just sitting there for a little bit. 
I've heard of people doing that as well. Or maybe if they're not totally able to, you know, hike out to the river or, yeah, a little more accessible. So there's, there's ways to have that be a part of your life, even if you don't totally feel safe, maybe going into the river, you can take that first step in your home if that makes you more comfortable. Yeah, for me, sometimes I like just to go to the creek and even just wash my face with the water. Nancy says, my uncle Victor baths in cold water his whole life. And during the winter, he would bath in our back pond if it wasn't frozen. He was one of the strongest men. Yeah, you'd have to be pretty tough to be able to jump into cold water. <laughs> well, it is interesting because Devil's Club had that same cleansing property and it was used to like rid yourself of the, the human scent to kind of like mask your, your human scent to when you're going out hunting. Yeah, and I think there's stories that people have too of like how we came to learn that, you know, you use Devil's Club in that ritual by just observing animals using those things. Just observing them and seeing what they utilize and pretty much learning that way that it's safe and that it's beneficial and that it should maybe should be something that we try to do too. It's pretty cool. We can look on, search for the stories about those too about our plant medicines, yeah. I was hoping um, Cecil Jr. would have stayed on because he has a lot of teachings himself about Nacolagula and some of these stories too. <clears throat> it's in this one. But... but we are, um, I'm not sure if, if anyone else has any questions for, for any of us. Um, You can add it to the chat or unmute yourself. Yeah. So the next meeting is at three o'clock again? Yeah, next Tuesday at three o'clock again. Okay, so it's just once a week every Tuesday? Yeah. Or is it twice a week? Um, just on Tuesdays where we're sharing the new human these stories. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Uh, on Mondays, we have Hasek L Learners Group from 3 to 4.30 p.m. And you can find the Zoom link for that on our Hasek L Learners uh, Facebook group page. And then Tuesdays, we're aiming to have Nuyum sharing and Nuyum readings. And you can um, keep this meeting invitation and link because it's going to be the same link for all of our Gyalthop events uh, for the next two weeks. Uh, on Wednesday, we have uh, jo Joseph Starr, Heisel author and also council member, who will be reading from his novel, Nuyum Weaver. And then we have a virtual arts and crafts gathering on Friday. Um, Friday from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. And that's part of our Gallup Lab event, so that's all the same uh, link, Zoom link. And then um, next week, we have the same time and uh, web link for, or Zoom link for Nuyum sharing on Tuesday. And then next Wednesday, we have, we'll have Brioni Penn, who was the author of the Magic Canoe book that was the tellings of um, Cecil Paul Sr.'s journey in the protection of the Kitlope. 
so that will be 7 p.m. next Wednesday. And then again on Friday, we have our arts and crafts virtual online group from 3 to 4 p.m. And we plan on keeping these kinds of da these dates and this, this format as a regular occurrence for the rest of our programming, because I think we're probably going to be relying on doing things virtually for quite some time. So this is how we want to connect people at home with our culture and language. So uh, just keep an eye out for new Zoom links um, for next month, because we'll reset the Zoom links for, for each month. And if you can't make it to every single gathering that we have, we will be recording them and uploading them to YouTube. However, uh, we it won't be a public listed recording. We'll be um, sharing the link upon request. If you can't make it and you would like the link, just let us know and we'll get the link to you. It will also be shared on the Hezekella Learners Group under a separate album uh, titled Gelt Plot. Cool. That's my plug for all of our events <laughs> this month. <laughs> We've got a lot going on. I'm not sure if anyone is um, reads the due teeth, but we had a press release go out uh, in the most recent um, community newsletter, and it was discussing a rapid word collection recording project that we have underway. We're expected to launch it. The, a lot of the recording work in September, and we're looking to fill roles to help support the work that needs to be done. If you look at the press release and the duty, it has all of the different roles there. And if you are interested and want more answers or you'd like to like ask questions specifically about that, we'll be holding an info session uh, next Wednesday from 2.30 to 4 p.m. And we'll be posting the, the information for that as well because it will be a virtual event as well. So, well, that's all I have on the, <laughs> the program updates. Thank you, Megan and Maddie, for hosting this portion of our Gallup Lab events. Thank you, everyone, for attending and um, paying mindful attention to our hosts. Um, and yeah, uh, I appreciate you all coming out. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Wallace. Thanks, Wallace. Thanks, Wallace.